because I'll start filibustering and all that. There it is. Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. And we have I'm Michelle Fife. Fife's in the house, man. Here's the yeah. deal, everybody. Michelle is coming to Pittsburgh in September, and Jimmy thought it was a an excellent idea, man. Maybe we stream this conversation because we're going to have a, a talk anyway about what kind of episodes we can do. You know, like Michelle has some stuff that we don't have on tap. So we need to go through a handful of things and see what uh, what Homeboy has. And maybe that will be, be a week's worth of episode. That's the plan. Like when, when Michelle comes to town, we'd like to do a week's worth of eps with him. The shoot interview in person is a must. So that's one down. Yeah. But, uh, you know, let's let's have that conversation right now in front of everybody. And maybe uh, people in the audience, there might be a little bit of uh of feedback uh that lets us know when we have a hit on our hands uh one thing that you mentioned were these were these uh walt simonson sketchbooks and i think that that sounds like that sounds like an episode oh yeah here let me show let me show them real quick you want to see him take a peek absolutely hey, this is one of them right here so it's like a zine that i doubt Walt Simonson folded the pages and stapled this himself, but it's still pretty cool. You think he got like one of his SVA students to do that shit, man? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> He's got a little like assistant or something to do it. So it's all awesome. It's, 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 I mean, it's, it's like, you know, that book, The Art of uh, Walt Simonson that DC put out back in 88, 89. It's like a, a another version of that, but more it's just super curated. I mean, he's got notes in here. He's got a really rare art, you know, that's not published anywhere else. So I got three of these, so I can bring those if anyone wants to hear me talk about my uh, unconditional love for Simonson. You know, heck yeah, man, that might be one of the things. Like uh, we 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 touch on all the all the big FIFA type creators, and Simonson is certainly a part of that stew. I know this, uh, me going to Pittsburgh has been kind of cooking for a while, but really was cemented at Heroes when I was talking to Jim about driving super long time to go bin dive. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, why don't you just drive to Pittsburgh? It's less time, more fun, more bins. And I'm like, that's a no-brainer. I mean, yeah, of course. That's my next big trip. So that's how this all started. Yeah, it's less insulting, man, because you like drove, drive by us to go dumpster diving. Uh, for no, the, the other no, what I, no, that big trip was to Hamlin's. Right, but you're going down, you know, like. Uh, I, no, I didn't pass you. I didn't pass you at all. I'm just fucking with you. We're just having fun here, Michelle. <laughs> no room for fun. No room for fun. Fuck so, that. So, so we were talking the past the the past couple of. I days. just don't want to offend you. That's all. No, I know, of course. <laughs> We we're talking the past couple of days, and 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 you were pulling some books. So let's talk comics, man. I is that's 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 uh, Simonson down. All right, hold on. Well, I also got a bunch of this stuff too. Tossed it out. Old kid art. I don't know if anyone wants to see this stuff. I like do. My old Bat Devil comic, inspired by a uh, Daredevil and Batman. You know, so it's like just a bunch of stuff. I could pick out like the best of the best of the stuff, like the most readable or the most fun and ridiculous of the bunch, you know. What or we is, could go through all like 300 sheets of little kid pages. I, I feel like that's the move, that's man. Like, kid. like I, I remember one of our earliest show intels was something like, you know, a thousand crappy pages or something. And I, and I showed, you know, all of my kid work uh, because of that old... Uh, McFarlane type maxim, you know, you got to have your thousand bad pages before you turn pro. So it could be, you know, 1000 crappy pages over again. And, and, and it's, it's the FIFA trajectory, man. <laughs> Not saying that this stuff is crappy, you know what I'm saying? But like that, that proto work, that kid work, extremely inspiring, man. I was just talking earlier today about how, like, uh, I feel like there was, um, Jaime Hernandez did it and Robert Crumb did it where they took some of their kid comics and with their professional skills went back and like redrew the strips mm -hmm. and that shit is so fucking cool. You know, there's a lot of yeah. value to that shit, man. Yeah. I've thought about doing that too, actually, because some of the stuff 
it is kind of fun looking right and uh i've done a little bit of that like on my patreon sometimes i post things about like old comics and stuff and i would redraw some of the, like the ridiculous dialogue but just for like a like a little drawing i don't spend much time but sometimes i'm like maybe i should just make a whole comic like that you know i don't i don't know what the market for that would be just super like selfish on my part <laughs> you know i would just do it for myself and maybe people will dig it so who knows I know what you're talking about, the uh, the Jaime one. That was the Easter egg hunt, I think. Right. Yeah. I think it's something that uh, may maybe he drew and Beto wrote or something. Yeah, the same same deal with um, the Crumb thing. It was one of those, like, Chuck and Bob comics, like one of the two mans that he did with Charles. That might be one of the things where, where with those guys, like, it's, like, it's extra special when they have, like, a collaborator or something. Yeah, who's a family member. <laughs> that might help uh, alright so up next I have a bunch of punks comics I know you guys have talked about maybe talking about this so I figured I could bring over one of these there's a special a manga special what's the ultimate Keith Giffen comic though because I feel like you're a Ke you're a Giffen mark for sure so we should we should do like a the biggest I mean, Willie Keith I Giffen mean, there are a lot of Keith Giffen highlights and I, I have my own favorites I think this is just kind of like it encompasses him at that moment. Yeah. Which is like when the industry was really bad. Oh, yeah. So I find that to be super interesting that he was like this DC guy. And then he did this. Same thing with Jurgens. Jurgens did, you know, was a Superman guy and went to doing Solar, you know. So that to me is like a weird example of like uh, career moves right. from that time period. Like how everything was like scary and on like thin ice, right? And so this was the result. And this is just some sort of like weirdo, irreverent, nothing comic. This went nowhere, it got canceled and abandoned super quick. Um, so I find it in itself that's interesting. But he actually does some pretty interesting work here. He's not riffing on anyone. It's just kind of, it's almost like pure, pure Giffen. Um, so I find that to be interesting. Um, but so that in itself might be uh, the prime Giffen comic, the platonic ideal of a Giffen comic. But I would put, you know, Trencher up there. I would put, um, you know, early Video Jack issues. Uh, I mean, there's so many. Ambush Bug. Ambush Bug number four specifically was the first one I read. And it was awesome, you know. Right. So I can talk about that. I could pull that out, too. It's real cool to... Like, Punks is a good one because that's sort of where we're at with the Wizards. You know, we're seeing ads for that and shit. Yeah. In the Wizard yeah. magazines that we've been covering. So maybe that's... Maybe that's a thing. Like, Jimmy... We don't have to do the special because he doesn't draw that. This is a rare... that Like, I never see this. I was lucky to come across this. I mean, it's like a quarter book, right? It's just not around. But it's printed manga direction. Like, they really just committed to the bit, you know? <laughs> it, so it's just... Are they doing kayfabe manga style? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the yeah. ads. That's super interesting. It's Kevin Lau. They should have gone black and white on it. You know, I'm sure the print run, the reason that you never really? see it anywhere is that print run had to be microscopic. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Because that series was supposed to be four issues, and I think only three were published, and then the special. And it sounds like the special maybe wasn't issue four if it's um, different artists and stuff. Yeah, they had, uh, I think he did the cover to four, and it, yeah, it was just never released. It was one of those things where the whole line just went bad, or they, they started chopping heads. Uh, yeah, but it's super interesting. That, that's something we can talk about. I could go on. Jimmy, what do you think? P punks, man, like, like uh, bring that, plus absolutely bring that manga one? Yeah, for sure. I have the first two issues of Punks, and I find it to be a really interesting series. It's kind of on my list for if I ever find you know, issue three or that manga special. So I would like to take a look at that. That sounds good. It just, I got to say, it's, it's, it's funny. Cause it's like, uh, it's like almost like improv comics. Like, cause he really was letting loose, you know, almost like more than trencher in a way. Cause he just did not give a fuck about this. He does not. And in his not giving a fuck about it, it it's just super interesting. I think it's just a, a, a an interesting blip in his, vast career he's really issue two is is uh like i said it's one that i have and i've looked at and it's it's fascinating it breaks 
I don't know, I guess fourth wall, it breaks a lot of comic conventions mm -hmm. and it just does some formal stuff that I can't think of too many comics that go there. And especially yeah. for like a Marvel DC, you know, mainstream superhero type cartoonist, it's uh, it's pretty out there. Yeah, yeah. And it's super reverent, like more so than his ambush bug stuff, because he just straight up makes fun of everybody. Like the, the publisher, his editor, his collaborator. <laughs> it's, it's just, and it's, it's like no one does that, right? I mean, he's known for doing that, but he really ramps it up in this one. Again, because he has nothing to lose. Yeah, he's like, funny. You could the industry's in a, in a, like, it's going down. Everything's burning. He's just fucking going for it. Yeah, thinking about that period of time, I mean, he's, he's like, uh, what do you call it, man? He's like, Al like, Alan Moore and Keith Given are the dudes who are fucking around and messing with these other publishers mm -hmm. you know what i mean yeah he did tons of stuff for image during this time he did a tops thing that fell through uh tons of stuff and what's interesting to me about this stuff too is that to me he's sort of like an example of like uh, having a career bedrock right like he's just a dc guy right he's fucked around with marvel in the beginning that's how he got his break and then he went to marvel around this time but the fact that he went to Valiant and did this, that's, it's, to me, that's really odd and compelling in a career lens, right? Where he just, he didn't have the home anymore. So what does he, what does he do? You know, he does this, you know, so that right there is like, all right, well, what do you do with that freedom? That's sort of like a little bitter, a little scared, but also kind of fearless in a weird way I, it's an odd thing it's i these comics should not exist there's no reason for them to exist <laughs> i'm sold it's a, it's a great hook i'm sold man <laughs> put, put them in your bag bring them along yeah all right <laughs> all right man so we got uh fifa shoot interview simonson sketchbooks we got punks that that covers keith giffen uh all right. we haven't done much bray fogel Batman or anything like that? Is there any of that? Anything that this guy? Yeah. You mean that dude? That dude, man. What number is this that? This guy's bagged. This guy's a, a, a bagged and boarded because it's very special to me. It's the one I had as a kid, so it's like nearly falling apart. I'll bring this copy because I, I remember drawing it too. I don't know. Um, but I this is one of my favorite issues ever. What number that is that? Run. He fights the uh, the serial killer. Not, not the one of the many. Stark, his name is. Uh, I'll open it in Pittsburgh. How about yeah. that? <laughs> what number is that, dude? Uh, Five ninety-three. Uh, okay. Feels very thin because uh, I used to rip out the ads of DC Comics back in the day. To, to <laughs> so that you didn't break up the storytelling flow. I just there were yeah there were interruptions, and uh, but I liked the ads so much. I remember collecting a stack of ads so I could still look through them. I didn't throw them away. It was, it's such a weird habit. Such a weird habit. And this is proof that I, that I, that's what I did with my comics. Um, Marvel, you couldn't do that because they would print ads and comics on the same page. Right. So I couldn't really do that. So all my daredevils are like intact. Near um, another old comic I bought back in the day was this, which is the first Justice League that Giffen plotted, you know, he's infamous for this thing. I don't know if this is a little too over uh, discussed in the world. Uh, it just happens to be the one I bought back in the day for a lot of money. When I was a kid, for, it was a lot of money even by today's standards. But even though you could find this in a bin easily these days. But back then this was sort of like a, a holy grail and I got it. But I love this run, especially the first 12 or so issues before it became uh, too funny. You know, it's known as a funny book, but it's not really a funny book. It's a well-rounded, awesome book. I don't know. Have you guys read that stuff at all? Before I have. I go on too much further. I, off I, I definitely read that first issue, and I can't remember if I had, like, a small collection of that or if I just had the first issue for some random reason. Mm -hmm. um, but I do remember that. It's Kevin Kevin McGuire, right, on the uh, mm -hmm. finishes? Yeah, it's like he's not even a year into his career. Like 12, does uh, does Batman right? punch out Guy Gardner? Is that... Does that happen in yeah, that's that one? Yeah, yeah. That's in uh, issue five. Yeah, that's the classic scene. Yeah, I must have had a trade paperback of it then, because I remember that part, and I and I kind of remember that first issue that you were holding up. Yeah, I got these. 
just random on my shelf. One of these, maybe, I don't know. What is that? I have these Here, in so many formats. I love this shit. <laughs> you, you know so what, I, Michelle, when we're quiet, it's just so that we can see the video, because if we say something, then the vid goes, gotcha. goes to us. So gotcha. don't think that you're bombing or anything. If uh, you're oh, right. I'll, still go. I'll still go. I'm not worried about that. I'll still talk no matter what. Everyone gets to sleep. I don't even know if anyone's showing up or not, but I have British reprints of this stuff. Giffen, Lobo, McGuire. I mean, I collect this. This is like the one thing I kind of obsess over, this period of DC Comics. Which, Jim, I don't know if you were here when I was telling Ed, but this is, or maybe it was through text, but um, I'm bringing out mostly DC stuff because DC's, I think, underrepresented in, in the k channel. Uh, with good reason. Don't get me wrong, I get it. Like, those uh, wizard ads, oh my god. Like, how did they even stay in business after those fucking ads went to print? <laughs> I get it. I get it. I get it. I get it. But, you know, that's just the shit I like. You know, it's the stuff I grew up with. Yeah, you know? totally. It's stuff, you know, it, you could boil it down to as simply as like uh, the toys, the cartoons, and the movies, right? That's what I saw. I didn't see uh, Secret Wars. I didn't see those Marvel and his friend, uh, Spider Man and his friends, or whatever that show was. Right. So I'm just, I got DC in my system. One of them, I'm going to pull out one other artist that I love dearly, is a, a Trevor Von Eden rarity, which, by the way, is weird saying that anything DC put out is a rarity, but I don't think this book gets talked about much. Uh, it's a Richard Buckler cover, so maybe that's why people sleep on it, but it's Trevor Von Eden. It's primetime Trevor Von Eden, ink by, uh, sorry, colored by Lynn Varley. Oh, sick. Uh, and this is right after that annual, the, the, the you know, the annual where he broke, broke out right. and right before Thriller. So this is like prime time Trevor Vaughn needed. Like he's going off. Yeah, I'd be so to see Look. some more of his, his Batman type work, man. The, the, the very first issue of Batman I, that I picked up as a kid was freaking uh, 401 or whatever. The mag, one with Magpie on the cover. Yeah, John Byrne. Yeah, yeah. And, and that stuff blew my mind, dude, because like. It, lo it looked like Golden Age comics in a way, you know, like kind of that heavy, uh, dull line, uh, that saggy mat. It almost looked like the uh, Batman and Robin from, from the um, serials, you know, like yes. the old black and white that's, shits. That's right. That's right. Some of it reminded me of the TV show, the 60s show. Yeah. And in, in a weird way, that issue, I know what you're talking about, is uh, in a weird way, it's my introduction to Toth. You know, when I right. saw Toad, I was like, oh, that's like that magpie issue. Totally. I, I, dude, say, same deal, man. And uh, he did a few fill-in issues like around DC Comics, like that one that you're holding up. Got some cool stuff. Oh, that's there. hard yeah, to tell. He a, His compositions and page layouts on some of those like one-shot fill-in issues are fantastic. I remember same. going uh, when we were going to the basement cells, like like seeking all those out and finding most of them for a buck. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I'm excited to look at more Von Eden. I, he's one of my favorites, too. And yeah. for whatever reason, we've only looked at a couple of his books so far. So I think yeah. those one-shots or or, uh, or fill-in issues would be really good stuff. Yeah, put that one on the list, man. Put it on the list. It's a, it's a scattered bibliography. Like, he did Thriller, and then that's kind of the only consistent thing he ever did. You know, he did that random issue of World's Finest, a couple more World's Finest, and just all fill-in stuff. You know. He did a bunch of Black Canary, and um, oh, you're right. He did that whole. Yes, you're right. But he you know what? Like, it oh, doesn't. Just... It doesn't feel. It, it's not very exciting. The Black Canary stuff. I often look through that, you know, and I think Trevor Von Eden, and I'm so excited to look at it. And it's it's the least exciting stuff of his for me. Um, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's kind of weird like, how much he ebbs and flows through through his career. Uh, you know, I uh, uh, politely asked him what the deal is, like what happened, right? And during that period, he pretty much admitted that he was just depressed and hated working. So that period of like that Black Canary, because I wondered the same thing. I'm like, dude, this is not the same Trevor Von Eden. It's still nice and sharp, but it ain't the same. And he was like, yeah, I just did not care. <laughs> did not give a shit about anything. So it's interesting to see that that reflects in the work. I wonder if he was getting getting uh, what kind of feedback he was getting from editorial too, because the stuff that I like the most yeah. of his feels super experimental, mm -hmm. and uh, I can imagine editors, especially for some of those books, if they're thinking they're more aimed at you know eight year olds, 
I can imagine editors kind of reeling that experimental stuff back in a little bit. Yeah. So, you know, he may have been getting discouraged from, from both sides, maybe not a great uh, public response and maybe not a great editorial response. And yeah, yeah. Easy I, to I understand think, how that could happen. Yeah, I think you're on to something. And World's Finest, that's kind of like a, back in the day, that's a dying title, you know doesn't have long for this world so he does a few fill-ins no one's really looking no one cares it's not like uh marquee i mean it's marquee characters but but this is what 82 83 batman you couldn't give that away no one cared in a pre-dark knight world you know right so he was experimenting and i guess they just didn't mind <laughs> you know sure you could do that here but then later on maybe they cared a little bit more i don't know speaking of dc though i do have this thing which is um it's a Spanish reprint of Flash, right? Which is what I grew up reading. Now that's all fine and good, but they used to print an entire issue of the American Flash. And then as a backup, they would do a uh, Green Lantern, half of an issue of a Dave Gibbons Green Lantern. So like that, that issue, for example, here are both, both versions. So the format's a, a little bigger, the printing's a little better. And this is like one of my earliest, earliest. I mean, I was like five when I read this shit. It blew my mind. Uh, so maybe we could do a compare. I mean, the comparison really is only about the printing. Obviously, it's in Spanish, but the story is great. I think uh, I personally learned a lot just by absorbing solid, solid storytelling. Yeah, man, that's the hallmark of uh, Dave Gibbons. It's 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 great. I mean, it really freaked, the story freaked me out. It, it was really compelling stuff. And then the first half is like weird '80s Carmine Infantino Flash, right? So this this whole package is just like a weird. I mean, I like foreign editions, but this is like what I grew grew up with, pretty much. I was a little ass kid reading this stuff. Where, where was that published? In Spain. So I was living. I lived in Spain for about a year when I was like five. Um. And so we went to the newsstand, and those were my first comics. I never got comics before that in the States. You know, it was mostly the toys and the cartoons and all that stuff, but the, a comic book was this. This was like some of my earliest stuff. So these two issues consist of this, pretty much. So I could compare and contrast um, both versions. And again, for some reason, I, I prefer this printing, the Spanish one, because again, it's magazine size, it's a little wider, and the printing is sharper. So, especially with a guy like Gibbons, even though he's bold, um, you kind of lose a lot in the American edition, even with the color holds and stuff, like that sort of thing. It just looks so much crisper in the Spanish edition. I wouldn't mind talking about this, but you know, it is a DC book, so fair warning. <laughs> Do you have any original art? that you've collected over the years or anything that you would, uh, a page is something that you would want to break down? I, like from somebody else, I could bring it, I could bring something. Maybe I would have to look, I don't, I'm not really an original art collector. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. I have a couple of cool pieces that I've, I've come across or they've been gifted to me. So it's not like, holy shit, this page, let's study it and talk about it for an hour. It's like, it's like, Oh, it's a cool page. Yeah. It's fine. Right. You know? I see. I see. Um, it might be something that we could do um, a page or two like that that's significant to you, and then maybe a page or two of your original art. I'm always very curious about your originals. Yeah, oh, I could, I could bring something. I'm working on something right now. That's sick as hell. Hey, Jimmy, I have his, I have uh, Michelle's uh, video pinned, so th so you could talk and say stuff, and, and he's he's on the cam no matter what. Dude, that's sick as oh, fuck, perfect. man. Yeah, I just have to erase this a little bit, fill it out some, and then finish it. I'm trying to keep a schedule for myself now. Are you using gray graphite or blue blue pencil uh, for the underdrawing? No, not for this one. If I'm because I got to color this, I'm coloring the original on this one. Yeah, but for so I don't want to mess with it. You know, if I do it with blue, it's just gonna stay there. Right. The way I shoot it, the way I'm gonna scan it. But I've been messing around with blue line because it's so much comfortable for me to draw with a blue line pencil, which is like new to me. I had never used it because of Jaime fucking Hernandez <laughs> saying that blue line is for chicken shits. <laughs> and I took that to heart. Yeah. And I'm like drawing with this, usually I draw with like this cheap 
lead pencil, like a nothing, like I don't even know where I got this, like CVS or something, right. 10 years ago or something. And it's just, it smudges, it's not great, it's just not fun to draw. I, like, I have fun inking it, but when it comes to drawing and, you know, refiguring stuff, it just gets smudgy and weird. The blue line takes care of it all. But because I color my originals, I have to pick and choose what scenes I draw in that manner. So it's it's a mess. It's all over the place. It's not really a mess. It's just a, the page on my table right now is no blue line. But it's something I discovered recently. That's super cool that you color the actual originals, man. I wanted on the next stuff I do after Red Room, I, I want to do practical color. But I don't think I'm going to have the balls to, to color the OGs. I'm going to have to scan it and print up a print up some, some line art to give it a go. Because I want to play with markers and color pencils oh, yeah. and stuff. Yeah, yeah. But I just have no confidence in just hit, hitting the actual inked pages. You can always fix it in post if you mess up. Yeah, that's true. You know, clean it up or something. And it's it's kind of like painted comics from back in the day. Yeah. Or, or if, you, if you think of it like... Even like Lynn Varley paintings, right? Or Richmond Lewis painted over a layer, right? So that was safe, right? Right. You're just doing the layer on the actual art, you know? So it's maybe more, it's probably closer to <laughs> Bill Sienkiewicz painting, right? Uh, Electro Assassin or something, where it's like minus the lettering, of course. So just fuck it, just go for it. Yeah. Marker, I mean, that, that's what I use. I mean, I use colored pencils mostly, but watercolor wash marker ballpoint pen pencil i shade with pencil sometimes it's whatever works uh, so i'm not like oh i'm coloring the thing i better be careful it's got to be nice and neat like my pages are a disaster i do lettering edits as i'm lettering if something looks wrong i'll just scratch it write it right above i'll pop it in later it's 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 a lot it's a process hey here's, here's yeah, a question I think that'd be cool yeah. to show some pages and, and, and see examples of what you're describing. I just okay. did my, um, I did a brigade page for Liefeld mm -hmm. and um, did all the coloring, but on a printout. So I did my line art on a separate page, made the coloring easier, but I, I'm, I, I feel the same way. Like coloring on the page is kind of a neat break and uh, just use every material available. Yeah. But I don't know about like, if you're drawing with the line art still, do you find yourself like going on top of your color, like the right. line art or the black ink is something that's, moves in and out you know like when i work digitally it goes back and forth i might do some line art and then color a bunch and then do more line art do you do that on your originals uh, uh no it's all by step like once i do the penciling i move on to inking and that's all i do and then i move on to coloring that's all i do and uh the the, the line art the black ink uh isn't too compromised depending on what you use if it's like watercolor and it's real thick it might go over it a little bit so you might want to draw around it or sometimes a Prisma color pencil just dominates a black line, so you want to use it in like open areas, not really in, if you're doing like speed lines or anything, because that'll just like muck it, muck it up. Uh, so it just depends on what the drawing is and what the intent is, you know. Here's but it's super. It's it's fine. It's just super. It's for me. It's efficient. That's all. It's just getting it done because, and we couldn't have been able to do that back in the day. Right. It's because now we can scan things. Back in the day, it was like, that's why I didn't do color for years, even though I loved coloring in my sketchbook and my personal stuff. It's like, oh, what, what are we going to do with this color piece? We can't shoot it. You get, Publishers don't want that. Mm -hmm. You know, It's all about just ink line. It's all about that production limitation, which we don't have anymore. Thank God for me. You know. Here's a, here's a question, dude. Uh, are there any kind of Hallmark interviews that you'd like to revisit from old TCJs or Amazing Heroes or something like that, oh. that that we that we could break down some stuff that we didn't cover yet. Anything in oh. in like the Will Eisner Shop Talk book or probably any TCJ interview or Amazing Heroes. I think I have access to all that stuff. Um, I could bring my copy of uh, the Howard Shaken interview from TCJ, which I don't think you've covered. Have you covered that? No. no. Yeah, I don't think you've covered it. No. No, I'm confusing it with your actual interview. Of Howard Shaken, um, but that is one of my fucking. That is a great interview. If you guys haven't read it, I'm sure you've read it, but man, that is like my bible. That J book. Jimmy, what do you say, man? Break break down a fresh one of those. Yeah, I think that'd be really great. Definitely, I'd have to dig. I, I mean, it's right there. I'd have to move through it, but I'll just pull it out. And holy shit, I mean, it is like uh, you know, you know, I didn't go to school for comics. 
I didn't have a direct mentor. I wasn't, and you know, I just didn't have a job back in the day. That is the closest to learning about how to just think about stuff and how to, how to, you know, it, it's so big. It's such a big interview, and it covers so much. And it was, it, it was, it hit at the at the precise moment for me as an aspiring like nineteen, twenty year old. He's and that was when I was discovering Chaikin also. So the two were like. Oh, I love his comics. Let me check what this guy's all about. And it's like, oh shit, fuck yeah, awesome. Yeah, he's so, he's so cool too, man. Like I've I, been I, a fan I, since. I recommend anybody check out his paradigm videos uh, floating around on oh, the, yeah. the net, where where he's basically breaking down the clinics that he gave to like you know the Marvel, the Marvel job guys and shit at the yeah. at the actual bullpen and stuff uh, to just like explain, you know. Store, visual storytelling on the page and uh he came to he came to pittsburgh for a little festival and i took him out to dinner and i asked him i'm like man so okay so like the paradigm thing that's that's day two of of the clip so like what is day one and he's like day one is me just yelling at these guys telling them that like you're a professional now you're not a fucking fanboy grow up <laughs> grow awesome. up awesome. you know like realize that that you you got a job to do and and do the job your editor's not your friend they could be friendly and you can be friendly with them but you know he's got a job to do you got a job to do check your fanboy shit at the door do the fucking job and, yeah. and so there's like they that's a whole day of that <laughs> and then uh the next day is is the paradigm part but I actually don't don't remember that interview so so uh whenever you pull that issue out uh, please let me know the, the um, issue number and like I'll go through the archives and okay. scoop it up and, and hook Jimmy up with a copy and stuff so that we can prepare ourselves for that. But uh, I think it's like 107 or 109, something like that. It's past 100. It's 100 something. Yeah. But yeah, I'll, I'll shoot you. I'll shoot you the information for sure. Yeah, awesome. It's Tim and Gary going at it. And it's every time they interview. I mean, they interviewed earlier in like issue 53 or something. That's pretty spicy too. It's like real fucking going back and forth <laughs> but this other one is like the massive one and it was like right before Times squared uh right before he started doing dc stuff you know which by the way that's some of the stuff i i, I was going to suggest i don't know if you guys want to do that but like twilight or the shadow i'm down for doing that if you got i'd rather do the interview let's do the interview that's a, that's Wait, a little broader me, me me and jimmy haven't done done an interview breakdown in, in a long time and we, and we were talking that. about that earlier but if yeah, the interviews are know, fun. They give us sort of talking points and stuff. It's a little bit something different to, uh, you know, to build an episode around. So an interview sure. will be great. For sure. Uh, yeah, and real quick, if no one knows about this stuff, it's fucking great. It's Jose Luis Garcia Lopez drawing uh, Howard Chaikin's love letter to DC's Silver Age sci-fi comics, which, of course, uh, old DC heads hated, so fuck them. But it's just, <laughs> it's just really great. Really, really it's so thought out. I mean, it's really, it's a, it's a loving tribute to the, and doing, you know, Chaykin doing his own thing. And it looks great. I mean, this is like Garcia Lopez going off, designing everything. This is a masterpiece, I think. Yeah, I um, actually don't know that comic. It, it, I mean, it came and went. And I just, I had issue three years after the fact. Couldn't find the first two. And, and it didn't matter. I was in love with it. And eventually read it all, read it all. And it lived up to the hype. I mean, every any page I could just open up to. I mean, it's just masterful drawing, cartooning, lettering. I mean, is that, everything. Is Whole that pack. Steve Olive color? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's the... Uh... And I think it recently got uh, the graphic novel treatment, like the collection treatment. Finally, you know, after like 30 years or something. I don't know what held them up. Maybe it was a poor seller. I don't know. It's a prestige format book from 90, 91. So maybe it didn't do the numbers of like, I don't know, Batman versus Predator or something. So it's like, forget it. Mm -hmm. well, Thanks. Okay. So a non Marvel thing is this. I, I just had, I just recently got this back from uh, Binder, but it's a Nascenti, uh, pretty much a Nascenti book of oh, just terrible. Shit. I have two of them. This is the first one. So this is all her early shit, and I'm just now revisiting it. I finally found a, a chance to dive in and revisit this stuff. My and I goodness. wouldn't want to, you know, 
it's it's a thick book. We don't have to go over it. You you know what we would do? Like we would first off, it's 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 so nerdily cool to have this like these bound things, man. So so I feel like that that's a plus. So like I feel like what we would do is give it a quick breeze. Give it a breeze. You know, like go through the whole thing. Just yeah, just yeah, yeah. just shoot the shit, man. Uh, do some free association. You know, just talk some stuff. But then like let's let's crack an issue with J. Oh, see that's the one, dude. That that's the one. Like that's one of my favorites right there, dude. dude. This one is such. I'm is, like that's Inferno, I've right? Read this first volume. It's so fucking good. Yeah, yeah. It's that's so, double sized. It's so like this stuff. You know, you know, nostalgia is weird because sometimes you love stuff that's actually kind of crummy, and that that that's what I discovered with Suicide Squad. It's not, it's actually not. It's pretty sophisticated, elegant stuff that's really raw and powerful, and it's and it was a good comic. Yeah, I read this when I was like eight or nine. You know, so it's like this stuff is my shit extremely so we just did that I guess this one recently yeah yeah but i, I didn't mean, have this forever man this was a, a wall book forever what is that I true i did not have this for a while <laughs> there's that little that run really is exceptional and i feel like anybody that works on daredevil is cursed with the frank miller shadow looming over them yeah that, that you're always going to be you know separate from that but but that's a hell of a run the innocenti ramita jr run um, yeah, it's yeah. cool to see it bound like that. The nice thing with binding them is that you get the different stock for the covers whenever you bind the actual books. That's I'm right, such yeah. a fan of that as, as far as the books Me go. Too. Did she did she write uh, Lee Weeks ones issues? Yeah, yeah, yeah I, she wrote I, I his think, first issues. Yeah, I don't think I realized that. I, I have so all, I added a, like a bunch of extra stuff, like this uh, Marvel Age interview. Just I get to just really nerd out, and like uh, we, you know, like. Uh, oh, hot move pages. Bring bring those books. Yeah, that's great stuff. And then and then let's let's decide on a great uh, JRJR issue to to do in the in the micro. So like the episode will be let's look through the big books uh, mm-hmm. and just and just kind of wax all over it. And then like yeah. we'll, we'll go micro on like a specific issue. You make the call. Right. You make the call, and then me, me and right. Jimmy. But let, let's make it a JRJR uh, just because oh, like, it's so pleasing to the eyes, man. It's so funny when you when you get to his first issue, like Leonardo drew the, a couple before, yeah, and those are good too. Those are excellent. But something locks in when Ju- when John Romita Jr. is on. I mean, something magical fucking happens. Yeah. I don't know what it is, and it's it's a good case for collaboration. When you guys know the drill, that's weird. Collaboration is weird. Sometimes it's treacherous, right? Or it's not perfect. So we're like doing our own thing. We're good. We got this. But when you come across something like this, it's like that's the that's the goal. You want to unlock something magical like that. You know, people have examples like the Kirby Lee stuff, the Ditko Lee stuff, anything with Alan Moore, Frank Miller and his many nineties collaborations. And then there's this. This is really like up there, I yeah. think. Like the things you could achieve with just like a monthly rhythm where everyone's the same. The editor, letter, colorist, every dog is like just in the same pocket it's the same rhythm and everyone's kind of hungry you know at least the main you know the writer and the artist they just they're going for something and it works right so right now i'm kind of in the middle of the second book the second half of the ramita and lee weeks introduction um so that's interesting to see the shift there um the, myth, the only the other Mephisto thing shit. I have left is something similar, which is another bound book, but it's Suicide Squad. <laughs> and it's, um, I know you guys, Ed, you might have mentioned, like, maybe talking about Suicide Squad. You yeah. Had Heroes Con or something. Yeah, maybe. of course. I had uh, Luke McDonald draw yeah. on this one. That's another good reason to have these bound books. You just have the original artist kind of, like, do a little sketch for you. So he got to do that, which is really great. This is super nerdy, this one, because, you know, it's not just Suicide Squad comics. It's like Firestorm issues that, like, uh, kind of go into the story Legends by John Byrne and the, the rest of the crew. I mean, it's really geeky shit, but this is, like, it. This so, is it. So yeah. let me ask you Millennium. the question. Let me ask you the question. Uh, so say we say we do Suicide Squad. Like, what's the move? Is, is it, Do we do issue one, or is there a storyline no. that blows your mind? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's either this issue right here. And what issue is that? Number 10. Okay. Up up against the wall. It's just Batman infiltrating uh, the Suicide Squad. Simple concept. It's an excellent comic. Or uh, Death Zone. 
which is issue 16, which is part three of a, of a, of a small little arc. You know what, you man? We, go through it, but we, it's we, funny. This is great. We this might have great. to do Death Zone, and just maybe you give a give a glance to the audience at the real Death Zone. You oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, you, th- you think that's possible? Just a glance? It's, a, it's up to the fans. If the fans want that, I might bring it along. I the double know. Death Zone episode? <laughs> oh, man. That'd be sick as fuck, man. Let's do it. See, look at this. I added every who's who profile of every squad member. <sighs> you so know, we just... should hire you to put together collections for them. I, I love these extra features you've got in the back of these books. Yeah, it's so good. It's just fun. And it's the way I want to read this stuff, right? And then now, of course, the collector in me is like, well, I like the original format, too. I'll have that. I'll have to recollect this stuff because I kind of like the, the artifact of the single issue and the ads. And, you know, it's it never ends, guys. It never ends. <laughs> and like <laughs> like I, remember you, I remember you saying those exact words, including the sickness part when we were at <laughs> Heroes in the uh, in the warehouse and you were coming out with those with those great Capullo quasars. And you just looked at me, you're like, it's a sickness, man. <laughs> <laughs> so Those are good, man. <laughs> so where are we at, man? We got the FIFA shoot interview. We have Simonson sketchbooks, Chaken interview, Suicide Squad, uh, Death Zone Daredevil. issue, Daredevil yeah. big book, Trevor Vaughn Eden, World's Finest, one more original art or original art word word i feel like we oh. got it man that's a fun day of comics talk right there that's goddamn right and and did you, you yes did you mention the simonson sketchbooks yeah yeah all right i could bring anything simonson i got it all i got most of it at least what's what's the quintessential simonson dude maybe maybe we got to go comic with, man, with simonson that's, that's rough that's rough because i really do think his Orion run is excellent. I think that might be the best uh, Simonson thing. I think I could make a case for that. It's not his, but that's not the point. I think his love really shines through on that Kirby stuff. Yeah, J- Jimmy, you know, what are you what are you thinking, man? Like, sh- should we should we go an issue of comics and then show the sketchbooks? Yeah, that'd be an easy way to do it. Um, yeah, I think that would work. Is there a, is there a good Orion uh, single issue or two that would make sense? Well, there's a, an all fight silent issue. Uh, there that, it is. That sounds then. good to me. There it is. It's just uh, issue five where Orion fights his father, Darkseid. I mean, it's fucking awesome. <laughs> <laughs> sounds fucking yeah, cool. I feel like I'm going to be digging that out tonight after we hang up. <laughs> You know, it's it's kind of like Burn in a way, where it's like his best work is on other people's characters. As good as Next Men is, and Danger Unlimited and all that stuff, and that stuff is good, you know, he's putting the work in, he's thinking about it, but something about his Fantastic Four, you can tell he loves that shit. Yeah, and he admits that. Like, he, yeah. he talks about, like, you know, like, Next Men's a trifle. Even, even shit like Alpha Flight, he was like, you know, oh, it, didn't, it, didn't, it. it didn't feel like a real comic. It's because right. Stan and Jack didn't create it. Like, like you know, that's the shit that, like, if Chaykin gave him that clinic, he'd, get, he'd grab him around, around the collar and slap him a little bit and say, listen, <laughs> you're a professional now. <laughs> check, that, check that fanboy shit out the door. Oh, my. There's a great Chaykin quote talking about John Byrne, but he never n- name checks him. I think he... <laughs> I think Jacob was like, I can't believe that the premier artist of our generation is uh, a second-rate Canadian hack with a like barely a grasp on anatomy. <laughs> and I thought he was talking about Todd for a second, <laughs> but the time doesn't line up. The timeline does that up. He was talking about Burn. Right. Like, oh, shit, amazing. He just nailed it. <laughs> yeah, Jacob will do that, dude. Like at that same dinner, man. Like he was saying some stuff that was making me blush. <laughs> he's funny dude guys Man, that was awesome you guys had dinner holy shit that must have been something yeah yeah it was it was awesome and and then uh they, they were just randomly the the restaurant was playing some like old classic jazzy type shit that he dug man uh-huh. and he's like oh you gotta listen to this part listen to this part and i was like yo uncle howard man we set this whole thing up they just didn't put up 
the uh, the framed Collier's magazines like I wanted them to. Man. Like we, we got here a little too early. <laughs> Where was this in Pittsburgh? Yeah, it was, in, Pitt- it was in Pittsburgh. Are you going to be at Baltimore? Wait, what's that? FIFA, are you going to be at Baltimore uh, Comic Con? No, I can't. I'm not going to be able to go to Baltimore. Okay. I miss Baltimore. It's been a while since I've been. Yeah, good, good fest. Because, because like we're planning on uh, gra- grabbing some grub with uh, with Howard then too. Make make your ass yeah. come if if you were there. Oh, that'd be awesome. No, maybe next time or at another show. I don't. He's never been to Heroes, I don't think. Yeah, I don't think so. I tried to sell him on it, man. I'm like, yo, that's that's a show to go to as like a fan of comics. He's like, I don't even have comics in my house anymore. I'm done with that. Man, I want to see. Part of me wants to be like that, but I'm just. I have to. I I can't do that. Yeah, no, it's impossible. Because uh, when I did uh, Speaking of Heroes, Giffen said the same thing. He just doesn't own any of his comics. He doesn't own any comics at all. He destroys his comps, right? He destroys the comics he's worked on, and he's gotten rid of everything he, he's owned. And that to me sounds like so almost a zen, right? Right. Like just not to be bogged down by anything. But then anytime I go through a purge or something, I'm like, oh, fuck, I want that back. Like, I want to look at it. <laughs> you know? Like, I don't want to get rid of this fucking book, right? You know? like Fuck yeah, man. A lot of work went into, like... You know, and, and just consideration went into this, and I actually do want to reread it. It's not just a, an item I consumed, and I just put it on the shelf for some porn, you know, some shelf porn. It's like a thing, an item I love. So I'm always sort of like struggling between, you know, trying not to be consumed by the hobby, but also like loving it or loving the parts I already love and just doubling down on that, you know. Not, not seeing it in a negative way, but just kind of just embracing it, you know, just trying to stay positive. So I don't know, Howard. I don't know what to tell you. Just, just, just wait till you step foot in the studio, dude. Just wait, <laughs> wait till you see what what the hell's going on over here, man. <laughs> Had a landlord at this joint. Yeah, man, you and can he, schedule I, one of your days of digging at uh, at Ed's place, probably. Had had the landlord at this joint say like, you know, I'm going to take advantage of this uh, this housing market. I uh, I think I'm not going to be a landlord anymore. I'm going to put this house up. I'm like, dude, I'm just going to buy it because I like I'm just I, I can't move this shit out of here. Just don't move. Like just just. Just name name your price, man, and and we made we we made that move and everything, so it's like I'm now a landlord, and a lot of stuff comes into this studio. A lot of stuff comes into the studio, and at a certain point, uh, I'm probably going to have to absorb the up top to just keep the library growing. To be honest, wow. man, yeah, because it's get it's getting out of hand. You'll have to move upstairs, Ed, and keep the library downstairs for weight issues. <laughs> like yeah. structural structural security i go downstairs and i take it to the basement i do take a look at that main beam a little bit sometimes man i visit it i make sure that <laughs> that uh you know it's still you know i knock on it make sure it's still holding things up somebody told oh, us gotta pray that there are no floods too because that's like a nightmare oh yeah we don't have any of those issues here man there'll be no, no you don't have a, you no. don't have danger of that no we got basements and stuff man i don't keep nothing important down there uh there, who was it? Oh, well, we're streaming, so we won't say the name. But but there was a professional who who had a whole big studio on a second floor, a bunch of tchotchkes up there. We'll talk about after the stream. But his his shit fell through. In fact, oh, no way. yeah, yeah. In fact, what what if we? I think I feel like we've we've uh, we've arrived at the the comics that you're gonna bring, man. So like, let's we'll wrap up this stream. Yeah. Then we'll just have a conversation. Before we, before we wrap it up, Ed, let's do one last. Uh, I have one more question for, for Michelle, for everybody. Yeah, do it. Um, what didn't make the list? What were the honorable mentions? If we uh, if we said keep going, you know, you always hear about the late night shows when it's like, tell us a story. Uh, what else do you got when they're screening them? What else was on your list? What didn't make it? Yeah. What didn't make it? Well, I kind of wanted to talk about this. Like Japanese versions of X, Jim Lee X Men stuff, oh, but you guys have covered that stuff. It's just it, again, it's just an interesting packaging. It's like, like it's just really nice to look at and yeah. kind of see that art through that context, not really understanding what is being said. Is it it's per- just kind of perfect? The whole like the fact that this is like recycled art, but it's zoomed in. I mean, it's perfect. I mean, there's a lot of gloss to this right now. A lot of yeah, that's about. an exciting looking package. Yeah, with the little strip down here. Oh, uh, those are just a uh, um, subscriber. Show us some pages. 
<laughs> so so you got this inside front page sort of which is just again just a weird art di art direction zoom in of a random page but then it's like i wonder if you could see that i just reread that stuff myself man that, that like one through 11 like i actually i didn't get much much past that chris claremont shit. like the chris claremont stuff yeah. ra wraps up really really well and then it launches into that? scott lobdell or whoever what is that like, there it's got, it's got cool like just little profiles on characters i just love stuff like that yeah know? that's fun man i was making note of that when i was out there seeing what what makes the cut in japan yeah. That, and that's another interesting thing. It's like, okay, what's popular enough? Who decides that? Did they look at all of Marvel's books from that season or whatever? Anyway, another bound thing is a, a Kevin Nolan specific book where I just kind of, oh, sorry, this fell out. Uh, it's just a bunch of covers and stories, Kevin Nolan. Same, same thing with the bound thing. It's just a curated, whatever I have at the moment i tried being as, as complete as possible but it's sort of it's sort of weird jimmy we did that outsiders right yes yeah you guys did that i love nolan's stuff when i first started reading comics he did like four covers of of the incredible hulk it was a book i was reading at the time and they just looked like alien like this one or the 80s one it was the 80s one it was like the incredible hulk series probably like the mm, 360 somewhere around 360 and oh yeah was there a werewolf there was and it was this like super open line art style they were the most bizarre covers it blew my mind he had that wild style like the the stuff that he was doing for like fantagraphics amazing heroes tcj uh his his stuff that's it started... yeah, that's it the goes. stuff look at how bizarre <laughs> that stuff is like the color the lines it's just all i had never seen anything like it i guess i still haven't but yeah that's good stuff he signed this for me too was that down to Heroes? I had no, it was a near Comic Con from like ten years ago or more, but it was a. Uh, I just had a bunch of ripped off covers, and he was like, "Oh, we used to do this stuff back in the day. It's kind of like a file for just artists that you like." And then years later, I have I had enough of this ripped up stuff in just bags. And I'm like, oh, I might as well make a book out of it. You know, I have that that that's what kicks yeah. it off. <laughs> so it's fun. It's the weird part about that Hulk cover is that uh, apparently John Romita hated that cover hated it hated it and he, he would drag he, he would show everyone around the bullpen as to how not to do a cover for some reason he just couldn't fucking stand it which i think is hilarious that is funny i think i reprint that cover really small in a uh, letters page in the in the hulk grand design book <laughs> was it uh like from marvel age like a because there I've seen another version of that cover which is a super like there are no shadows it's just line like what you were describing. Yeah, I can't remember where I found it. I think it may have been in the letters page because I was going through like I put together letter pages for my grand design collection, mm -hmm. and so I went through like all the letters pages to try to find good letters. But there would also be often little bits of art and weird scraps of stuff. And I think there were a couple of Nolan pieces scattered through that. And I think that might be where I pulled the cover art from. And it's a little more simple, you know, because it was yeah. like postage stamp size or, you know, a little bigger. Right. He also did, uh, Nolan used to draw the uh, the letterheads or the yes. letter columns. And there's one of the Hulk smashing. Right. His own thing. I don't know if that was for the Defenders or if that was for the Hulk. But I, I think I think I used that too. I think that makes it in there. I also... Uh, he did a Wolverine like six issues, the the Gehenna Stone. Oh yeah, yeah, it um, was awesome. That was another one of those like early in my comics reading that I was reading Wolverine, and I think I started at like issue ten, and I think he did covers for like eleven through sixteen, and it was the same deal where it's like these are really really weird. Like you could almost feel that they were weird without even having much comics knowledge. It just felt like this is so different than what every other comic book I have looks like. Remember a letter? I used to read Wolverine pretty regularly back then, and one of the letters for his covers was a reader complaining that Wolverine looked too much like Batman. Because <laughs> the ears were just super long, because he was just he would just exaggerate it, and uh, I just didn't care. You know, back then I thought that was cool. You know, like seeing all these weird versions. I mean, Batman alone had so many versions, and I loved them all. There's not one I did not like.
So anytime I hear about readers complaining, this doesn't look on model or this doesn't look like whatever, it's like, you fucking kidding me? <laughs> you just stick to the one you do like then. Like, don't worry about yeah, it. Yeah, right. Like, just move on. Like, what the, what the fuck? But to me, that was never a barrier. That was never a problem. It was actually sort of a uh, an advantage of liking comics. In that uh, that uh, Danzig video for Lucifuge, you know, the VHS tape where he's sitting there reading comics and they're like, what are you doing? Reading. What you reading? Comics. It's violent. <laughs> it's uh, it's the uh, Nolan cover Wolverine joint, the one where he's hanging out of the cop car or whatever that is, man. The, yeah, that's yeah, the yeah, best yeah. one. The that's magenta such a good cover. cover. Yeah. That one's good. That one's good. Yeah, super cool, man. So, like, uh, we'll 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 wrap up the stream, and then uh, we'll debrief a little bit, man, and then uh, get the show on the road, dude. Everybody can look forward to seeing Fife in the studio doing vids with us, man, doing a week's worth of episodes because you got a big ass book that needs promoting, man. That collected Coper, that is a heck of an achievement, my yeah. man. Yeah, yeah, that's coming out in November. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, it'll be right around that time. You know, just in time for Black Friday. What what is what does that collect, man? Let the, the people know. The Master Collection, it, it's the first 12 issues of Cobra under one oversized hardcover book. There it and is. And I put a, a bunch of extras in there, like unseen art, uh, process stuff. Uh, I tried making it as different from the rounds as possible. You know, the rounds have their own identity, and I wanted this thing to just be like a different, cool-looking item uh, for like old fans and new readers and you know, just something super accessible and cool. Plus, it's cool to have the first arc in one place, you know, and hardcover. I haven't had a hard... Well, there's, like, a French edition that was hardcover, but here in the States, I've never had that treatment, really. So that's going to be a cool, different thing for me. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. It's super awesome, and you've kind of proven your uh, your book, your, the thoughtfulness behind your book design. So that's exciting. <laughs> That's right. I would take that job in a heartbeat, though. <laughs> Dude, I cannot wait to kick it with you, man. After all the COVID stuff that we were all dealing with, man, I, I just missed you in general. Just it was so good to see you at Heroes Con. But of yeah. course, like we're all on doing doing, you know, the dog and pony show when we're down there. Didn't have enough time to, to actually kick it and chat and all that. So I cannot wait for you to come to the Berg. Can't wait to to go okay. dig in. We'll go get some dinner no at the right spots. Do do everything. Oh, yeah. All of it. I can't wait. Yeah, I want to go to whatever bin places you guys got or you, whatever place you recommend, I'm down for. Yeah, all of it, man. All, all of, of it. Fuck. Fuck yeah. Fuck yeah. Are you an early bird? Do you, you Oh yeah. Do you, do you guys get up get up early? Early and I go to bed late. Yeah. Because... I could do whatever's open. Let's go. Cool. Cool cuz I feel like if we if we shoot these vids early, and we have a lot of daylight. Like we could, we could hit everything up, man. Yeah, we work hard. We play harder. It's gonna be good. <laughs> it's gonna be good. <laughs> All right, man. I'm gonna end this stream. Say goodbye.